Welcome to Clyde Ryan Book Buzz panel. This is what we do every couple, it's like what, every other month? We really yeah. buzz get together and we talk about the books that we are currently reading or have loved in the past or can't wait to come out. Um, before I get started, I just want to say thank you to the Friends of the Library for sponsoring tonight's event. Please have a cupcake on them. They're pretty cool. Um, so we're going to do this kind of like, a, we're each going to go down the road, introduce ourselves, our name, title, and like the best thing that happened today so far. Was Ozzy is book buzz panel, but we're going to do a pre book buzz panel. Um, and then after that, we're each going to take turns talking about a book. Um, if there's no questions, we'll just get started. So I'm Molly Patella. I'm the head of adult services here at the library. And the best thing that happened to me today was I sat on the couch with my son and we ate waffles before I can work. And that was a high. As in so. <laughs> I'm Christy Pascaro. I'm a children's librarian. Um, and the best thing that happened to me today, I think, I guess I went home in the middle of the day because we were here early this morning and I came back for tonight. So I went home and my house was empty because my kids were at school. <laughs> and I sat in the sun on the deck and it was wonderful. <laughs> Hello. Um, I am. Miss Lizzie in the children's department, so I'm the head of the children's services, but I'm also transitioning into the name Eliza, so maybe I'll do Eliza at these kinds of events. So you can call me either. I'll answer to both, maybe. Um, and my high of today was I went to the Sheehan School for their Community Readers Day, and I had a lovely kindergarten class, and got to read to them, but most especially, I got to meet the new therapy dog that is going to live at the um, fire station. She, her name is Monty. She's a doodle. She's so sweet. She just came over and laid her head on my feet and just hung out there she, while we were waiting for the kids. It was, it was adorable. So I had a nice little puppy time today. So thank, I'm happy to be here. Hi, my name's Liz. I am oh, I'm not Eliza, <laughs> but I am Elizabeth to my oh. father. <laughs> And um, I work in tech services, I'm a tech services assistant. And so I process the books and get them ready for you guys to read. And I would say my high today was like Christy. I got to go home in the middle of the day. And it's the first day this week that it wasn't raining. So I took my dog for a walk. And it was very nice out instead of just freezing and being soaking wet. So that was great. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Caitlin Moore. I work over at the branch. I'm the library assistant over there. Um, and my high today is this is my first book buzz, so I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, we're going to ask the we'll do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the first book I'm going to talk about is called The 15 Wonders of Daniel Green by Erica Boyce. So this is a lighthearted and engaging debut novel from a Westwood resident. Yes, Erica lives in Westwood. So on Tuesday, April 30th, she'll so be here to talk about the book and sign if you're interested in meeting her and hearing about the book more. Um, so this story follows Daniel, who's a young man who's a member of a secret society of circlers. Who, and those are the people who travel around the country and they crop circles. Um, and although they are hoaxers, what they really do is work with the farmers who are trying to bring back the kind of mystique to their small farming communities, trying to get them on the map, get them on the news a little bit. Um, so Daniel goes around and he's doing this in his early 20s. Uh, and his newest gig brings him to Vermont, where he meets the daughter of the farmer who hired him. He's young and bright and lively. And so they end up going on an adventure that neither of them are coming, and it affects the entire community. Um, it's a fast read. It's a story of dreams realized and the power of family and reconciliation. It's a really good, feel good story. If you didn't know you needed it, it's like book therapy, book therapy, you know, the end of it. it's really nice. Um, if you read the reviews of Broken Wheel Recommend or The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Carol Fry, those are very popular, good books as well, um, you'll like this one. Um, and it's just, it's just fun, it's different. Like, have you ever thought about like people who make crop circles? I have not. So <laughs> this gives you a whole new perspective. And so try that one out. Hello. <laughs> 
So my first book is Once Upon a River by Diana Setterfeld. Setterfeld? Yeah, Setterfield. Um, she wrote The Thirteenth Tale. It came out like maybe 15 years ago, I'm guessing. But um, it was really popular and it came out. Um, and I didn't read her second book, which was Bellman and Black. But this is her third book. Um, so I've been trying to figure out how to succinctly describe this book because it's so big. Um, so I'm going to tell you how it opens. So imagine a small village on the banks of the Thames River in England. It's 1887. Um, and there's a group of locals sort of gathered around a fire in a pub. And they're telling stories because this pub is known for telling stories. It's where you go if you want to hear a story. So just as someone opens their mouth and is about to start a new story, the door bursts open, and this man comes in, and he's grievously injured, and he is holding what looks like a doll in his arms. Um, and he doesn't say anything, he just immediately collapses to the floor. But somebody catches the doll, and looks down and realizes it's not a doll, it's a child. And the child appears to be dead. So they call what is basically the best thing, better than a doctor, this nurse midwife who lives in the town. Um, and maybe in another time and place, she would have been accused of witchcraft. But in this time and place, she's better than the doctor, so they, they call her a lot. Um, so her name is Rita, and she comes and sits with, sort of fixes the man's injuries, and then sits with the body of the child and is examining the child, trying to figure out what happened to her, because she appears like perfect and pristine. She's not. The man was dirty and injured, and he was covered in river water like he'd been in the Thames. And she's pristine, like her feet are clean, she's not dirty, and she just can't figure it out because as she says, everybody tells a story, but this body is a blank page. So all of a sudden, the little girl wakes up. <laughs> she takes a breath, she opens her eyes, and she seems to have come back to life. Um, and she feels like it's a miracle. And the word spreads from there that this child was pulled out of the Thames and came back to life. And so as the story spreads, everything sort of unfurls from this point in the story. You hear about a few different people and their particular stories. Um, there's a family that lives down the river, and two years before they had, their child had disappeared from her bed in the middle of the night. So they hear about this child pulled from the Thames, and they go down to investigate, and they see her, and they immediately say, that's our girl. She, this is a miracle. She's here. And then you find out about another family, um, this man named Mr. Armstrong, who's been estranged from his son, um, and he's been sort of investigating what happened to his son, and it's just, he finds out that his son had fathered a child, and that this child was also, nobody knows what happened to this child. The mother disappeared, the child disappeared. He goes to the pub to investigate, sees the child, and sees his son in the child, and feels a connection, and says, you know, claims her as his own. Um, and there's a third story, you don't get as much of her story, but there's this maid um, who seems to be traumatized from some event in her past, and when she sees the child, she sees her sister who had drowned in the tent <coughs> years before. So you have this child, the child is mute, she doesn't speak, and everyone who sees her sort of sees everything or something that they've lost in their life. Um, but where did she come from? We don't know, nobody knows. And so I don't wanna say any more about what happens, but. Um, it's a really beautiful story. It feels like, it reads like a classic. Like, it felt like the way I felt reading like Thomas Hardy. You know, it felt like Tess of the Dribbles or something. Like, it's so beautiful. And it's, it's not a page-turning thriller. It's nothing like that. You do want to know what happens. But um, it's sort of like the story, like, this is a cheesy, <laughs> this is a metaphor, but just go with me. The story kind of laps at you like a river, what? But yeah, I don't know if you thought of that. But, I haven't been able to say that, but um, that's what it feels like. It's a really gentle read, um, but it's wonderful. I read it on Christmas Day. It was like the perfect thing to read under a blanket on Christmas Day. So it's beautiful, beautiful book. <laughs> Hard to follow. Um, so my first book I'm going to talk about is completely different, and it's a nonfiction. And I don't usually read nonfiction. And this is brand new, so I have a speed read right here, and I think there's one other copy available. Um, so if you can't grab it tonight, you will want to put your name in for it. This is called Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. And um, I can't stop talking about this, so if anyone has seen me in the last two weeks, I have been talking about this book. I have notes and notes and notes. Um, but to put it quite 
simply, it is a stress book for feminists, <laughs> but specifically it's about deconstructing stress specifically for women and how it affects us. And, it's a, and I don't read a lot of self-help books, maybe I should, but it's not self-help in a cheesy way and it gives you um, context for the science and it's actionable items of what you can do. So super briefly, we know that stress is this phenomenon in our body, that biology, and you have adrenaline, your cortisol, you know, going through your body when you like, you know, see a lion or you know, a hippo, like just back in the day, and your your body is telling you to do something, and usually it's to run, right? So fast forward to our society now, and especially as women, you know, we have all these stressors that might be something in the office with your family, with your spouse, just all of these things, and our body is still physiologically reacting to these stresses, but we tend to not, um, what they say in this book over and over is complete the cycle. So just as we have a digestive cycle and a sleep cycle, our bodies have these cycles and we have a stress cycle. And so even when the stressor, you know, the thing that's stressing you out is removed, you have these kind of, oh, most people carry these unfulfilled cycles that are just sitting in your body and it's slowly killing us. <laughs> because you don't notice that your body is kind of like out of whack in that sense. So you, you can't get back to this like state of, of balance and stress. And in here, they go through all, and it's when you read it, you're like, oh, I know that. That makes sense to me. Like, you kind of instantly recognize these, these things that you're like, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, when you uncontrollably cry at like a dumb commercial or something, and you're like, why am I like sobbing? And then you finish, and you have that like reset where you like take a deep breath, and you're like, oh, it's like your body is literally completing the cycle, getting back to its, its balance. Um, so the, this is written by two sisters, Emily and Amelia um, Nagoski. And they, it's very readable. They talk right at you. And um, I heard it from a podcast. They were being interviewed on a podcast that's for romance books. It's called Smart Women Trashy Books. And um, it's one of the best interviews that I've listened to in a while. And so if you're hesitant about it, just even listen to the interview because it's great. And they give a lot of um, great anecdotes and help explain it. But one of the things that they were speaking to women, that women in particular, we have been taught to be nice and we've been taught to be kind and generous and attentive to everybody else's needs around us and not to make anybody uncomfortable with something like our rage <laughs> or we're upset. So, you know, we put a smile on our faces, but we internalize this rage, so it, it's it's not, um, it's just sitting inside of us. So, um, one of the other things, I could go on, but I'm just going to point out two other things, is um, wellness nowadays. We keep hearing this word about self help and self-care and all of these things, but wellness is almost being marketed as if like an action that you have to do. And it's not just being happy and peaceful all the time, it's oscillating between states. It's okay to be sad or stressed out or you have to go complete the cycle. So, you know, on you know, social media and everything, everyone kind of is marketing as this thing that you have to do and you have to get, and you're like, okay, check it off. But it's not like that, it's okay to not always be happy all the time. But one of the most interesting parts of the interview is um, they were talking about how reading for pleasure and all entertainment of literature and music and art is actually like perfect for this, this cycle and how we can complete it. And of course, we're talking about romance. So if you've never picked up a romance, please do. Or if you've gone, I haven't read one in a while, in a while but especially this notion of um, guilty pleasure or reading for, like there's nothing wrong with reading for pleasure, whether it's a good thriller or whether it's a chick lit or whatever it is. Because when we're reading these stories and listening to you guys talk already, I was like, this is how you can complete the cycle of your stress. Because you are, there's no such thing as actually living vicariously through the characters. When you're reading about someone else's fictional life, whether it's the drama, the highs and the lows, physiologically, we are actually experiencing those emotions. So when you get to that resolution at the end of the book, you are, your body has literally got that, that kind of pulse of, yes, okay, I've got that resolution. I feel like you, know, you feel settled. So um, that's another research, brain research on this. So that's my other thought about what we do as librarians. We're like helping everyone live happier, healthier lives. So, um, but when I think of that with all the books that everyone's talking about tonight, I'm like, this is a great way, which is why people don't like cliffhangers. If you ever finish a book and it's a cliffhanger, you have a, a response where you're like, yeah, uncompleted stress cycle, where you're like, no, that's you get really upset, you need that resolution. So I'll stop talking about it, but it's it's really amazing. Even if you read the first chapter, it's enough to kind of get you thinking. So it's called Burnout. Thanks. Okay, so my first book is called Beautiful Bad by Annie Ward. And it is, 
I would call it a domestic thriller, sort of, but it it's interesting because it has many different um, settings. They travel the world in the book, and um, it also jumps back and forth in time. So it's pretty interesting, and it really grabs you right off the bat because it starts, the very first chapter is called The Day of the Killing, and it starts with a frantic 911 call, a crying child in the background, and a detective trying to decide whether to go into the crime scene with or without backup. So it sets the stage of something happening, but then it jumps back in time to where you meet the main character, whose name is Maddie, and she is a travel writer. She's living in Eastern Europe, and she goes to visit a friend um, who's working somewhere else in Eastern Europe that's kind of like war-torn, and um, she meets a man that she finds extremely intriguing named Ian, and they start sort of this volatile, off-and-on relationship, there's tension with her and her friend, and then one day, you then you jump forward in time, and Maddie is married to Ian, they have a son, they live in Kansas in the suburbs, and um, they go on a camping trip, and she has a head injury, she can't remember how it happened, and so it's all this, like, what happened, when is it happening? <laughs> and it's really like you can't put it down. So I felt like it, and it also explores a lot of different themes of what it's like to be in an unhappy relationship and PTSD. There's like some heavy things in there. And I'm just gonna read um, a review by Mary Kubica. Is that how you say her name? She wrote The Good Girl. I think that's how you say it. Okay, Kubica. Um, she says, Annie Ward explores this battle-scarred marriage on the brink of disaster in this death debut. It is touching and thought-provoking as it is terrifying. Beautiful that it will leave readers spellbound. A buzzworthy read. Okay. I wanted to include that because it has buzz. <laughs> do, do they complete your stress cycle though? <laughs> it, it may have stressed me out a little, but yeah. Um, but I would say that if you enjoy a good fast-paced thriller with that slightly different than the norm, that's good choice. Yeah. All right, so my first book that I'm gonna talk about tonight is called Attachments by Rainbow Rowell. Um, some of you may know her, she wrote a couple of young adult books, her most popular one is called Eleanor and Clark, which is great. Um, I believe that this is her debut adult novel, um, and it's just, it's really, really a good one. Um, so it's written in the point of view of a man named Lincoln. Um, and so he gets hired by a company to be in IT cybersecurity. And so he thinks he's gonna be this cool guy, he's gonna be protecting everybody, you know, fighting off those viruses, everything. Um, but really he's just reading people's emails. And um, he's supposed to be letting them know when they're using it wrong. Um, and so he comes across this correspondence between two women named Beth and Jennifer. And so Beth is in this relationship with a guy who doesn't sound too great, and Jennifer, I believe, is married. Um, and so, you know, they're just going back and forth, back and forth, like they're texting, but over email. Um, <laughs> and so he never sends them any kind of warning like he has before. Um, and then it gets to a point where he feels like, well, I haven't warned them, so I just shouldn't start now. Um, and then he realizes that he's falling in love with Beth, um, which is not great because she's a boyfriend um, and he's been reading her emails for a couple months, which is not a great start <laughs> to a relationship. Um, but he goes through these highs and lows with his family, with his job, where he thought he was in a different position than he actually is. Um, and so you just, you learn a lot about his life, you learn about Beth and Jennifer's life through their emails. Um, it's a really great book. You, it's a super, super fast read. I believe I read it in like two or three days. Um, but it's just, it's awesome. And anybody who's read her young adult books, like she's a fantastic writer, so I'd highly recommend it. <laughs> okay, so my next book 
is totally different. It's an oldie but a required reading, I feel like. It's Stephen King's On Writing, A Craft of the, A Memoir of the Craft. Um, so it's probably stupid, but as a librarian, I generally refuse to buy copies of books um, unless they're, it's for a gift or for my kid. Um, because I was like, I can spend a library and get it. I'm gonna spend money, blah, blah, blah. I own this book, and I'll tell you why. Um, it's part, like, biography of Stephen King, which in itself could be very interesting if you are a fan or not. He's just like a weird dude from Maine, you know, who's made millions of dollars with these great stories. But it's also a very, like, a master class of how to write well. Um, I think anyone, whether you want to be a novelist or you just want to send a halfway intelligence on an email to so probably pick up the book and glance at it a little bit. Um, so the, the, the story lover in me loves the, the biography part. Um, when someone calls a book a memoir, it's kind of weird because so often they have these conversations and these, they're like scenes in a movie. You know, it's so clear this absolutely happened. But in his story, he always has like, these connector words like I believe or I think it was or it might have been. So I feel like it, really authentic. He's not saying like, this is like a story. It's like how he really sees his past. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, again, like the writing is great. And one, the, about the writing, um, have you ever heard the quote, books are kind of portable magic? Yes. yes, that's in this book. And there's like 12 other amazing quotes in that book as well. Um, so I guess I'd recommend it for people who are fans of Stephen King. I would recommend it for people who are not fans of Stephen King. <laughs> um, and he, obviously, if you're an aspiring writer, you definitely pick it up and glance at it. I think it's one of those ones that you need to have on your shelf um, because he has like real basic um, tips for you. And I'm not a writer, but it was it made me think about how I put things down, like don't use the passive voice. Because I didn't even know what that really meant until like he spells it out like this is passive voice idiot. I'm like, oh, I get it. <laughs> Um, but he's actually very nice. He's blunt but friendly, which I never would consider to be king friendly, but he actually is in this book anyway. Um, so it's almost 20 years old. I think in 2010 they did like a 10 year like write up follow up on it. So I don't know if it's going to be another one for the 20th anniversary, but it's getting, it's good. It's a classic. So I would recommend picking it up. All right, so my second book is My Oxford Year by Julia Whelan. And um, so Julia Whelan, I found this book because Julia Whelan is an audiobook narrator. She's narrated a ton of audiobooks. If you're an audiobook person, you've probably listened to more than one book by her. Um, and I was actually searching through Hoopla um, to see what else she'd narrated, and I found that she'd written a book. <laughs> so that's how I found this book. Um, and I am an Anglophile. And so anything that takes place in England, I'm kind of halfway already like guaranteed to read it. Although that that's a lot of books. <laughs> Never mind. Scratch that. Um, but anyway, this is about an American girl, a 24-year-old American girl, a woman, Ella Duran, who wins um, the Rhodes Scholarship, and she, which is this prestigious award, um, and she gets the chance to fulfill her dream, which this has always been a dream of mine too, which is to go to Oxford, England, and study at Oxford. So. She is planning to study English language and literature from 1830 to 1914. It's very specific. Um, so she is. She gets to England. She's actually in the customs line, and she gets a phone call um, with a man who is offering her another amazing once in a lifetime opportunity, which is the chance to be to work on the campaign of this rising um, senator who's running for president. Um, because in her other life, she is an education consultant. And she wrote this article that got a lot of attention. And so she finally gets the chance to go to Oxford. And the minute she arrives, there she gets this dream job. And they're telling her she needs to get back now to do this dream job. Um, so she manages to sweet talk her way into working remotely for a year. She says that she will be always available no matter what time it is to answer her phone and consult. Um, and she's going to try to spend this year in Oxford pursuing her dream. So she gets to Oxford, and she's walking around experiencing the sights, the smells of Oxford. And she does that thing that Americans always do in England, where she crosses the street and almost gets, almost gets hit by a car immediately, because <laughs> the traffic's the different direction. Um, and the person who almost runs her over is this like amazingly handsome, blonde, rich-looking person <laughs> driving a beautiful car. 
and she kind of yells at her because <laughs> she's in the wrong part of the road. And she's like, whatever, you know, she's upset. And then she goes into this chip shop to have the experience of fish and chips, and she is at the condiment station, which is apparently really perplexing in England. And um, she turns around and runs right into this person, and her plate of chips goes all over her dress, and it's the guy who was driving the car. <laughs> the same guy. It's a meet cute, exactly. It's just like a romantic comedy. So this happens, they have words, um, <laughs> and she leaves. So then she starts her very first day um, of classes, and she's super excited to study with this professor. She basically went to Oxford. <laughs> to study with this particular professor, she gets to her class and that professor is not there. That professor is suddenly on leave and guess who's teaching her class? The guy. The guy. <laughs> she like cannot believe this. So he's, he has to be her advisor. They have to get to know each other because he's basically her advisor. I love this so much. So um, they get to know each other. They connect. They find that they have more in common than you would think. Um, but they both have secrets. And there are hard love choices to be made, of course. Um, so I don't want to tell you any more about what happens. I think I told you a lot already. But um, it's if if you love Me Before You by Jojo Moyes, which I know a lot of people love, this is the closest read alike to that book. Um, and I think that I'm not usually a big fan of romantic comedies. Like I'm a real tough. Um, I'm a tough sell. Like I feel like I've seen it all before, and I roll my eyes a lot at things like that. But with this author in this setting, it kind of kicked it up. So it was much like just being in Oxford, you get to feel like you're, you could just spend like you haven't. You feel like you're in Oxford for a year. So it's, it's a good one. It's very feel good. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not a tough sell when it comes to myself. Okay. So um, my next book is called The Last Romantics. It's by um, Tara Con Conklin. And this has been um, a lot of requests for this. We haven't had this in in a while. I actually listened to it on Hoopla, so if you are an audiobook listener, it's available for everybody in the room at the same time with Hoopla. And I actually just checked to see who the narrator was because I really liked the narrator. It was not her. But I wanted that connection <laughs> really badly. Um, so The Last Romantics, it's a moving story of family and the trials of love, both romantic and familial. Um, it's about poetry and the choices that we make through life that make us who we are, whether that's good or bad. Um, it's kind of a winding story. It starts in the year 2079, and it's this renowned poet, Fiona Skinner. She is asked, um, she's at like, an, like a presentation. She hasn't done a lot of public appearances in a while, and so she's very, very old by this point. And she's asked from the audience about the inspiration behind this, her iconic work, which was called The Love Poem. And she begins to tell, so the whole story is her telling the audience this story. Um, and she tells them about her family and this kind of betrayal that reverberates throughout time. And I'm just gonna, I shouldn't put it up again. <laughs> she says, once upon a time, I began, there was a father and a mother and four children, three girls and one boy. They lived together in a house like any other house, in a town like many other towns, and for a time, they were happy. I paused, and all those faces in the auditorium stared down at me, all those eyes. And then I stopped again, faltering. I sipped my glass of water. And then there was the pause. Everything started there. Our mother didn't mean for it to happen. She didn't. But this is a story about the failures of love, and the pause was the first. So I was like, what? The pause, as they call it, is, um, as she says, is that it's about these, the story is about four siblings. There's Renee, Caroline, Joseph, and Fiona. And Fiona's the youngest. And when Fiona's about four, their father unexpectedly dies um, of a heart attack. And their mother is totally at a loss of what to do. She didn't know anything about their finances. She didn't know anything about their house, all the, the debt. And so they live, she gets very overwhelmed. They have to move to the other side of town. And that's when the mom has what the kids called the pause, where she goes into this very deep depression. And as Mrs. Darcy did, she literally takes to her bed. And so she would wake up maybe once a day, but other than that, for like two or three years, the kids basically you know, ran the house. They would you know, take care of each other. They, the oldest would make like, peanut butter sandwiches. They would get by by what you know, other people in town would, basically like a food pantry that would be delivered. Um, and 
then a couple years later, the mom just kind of comes out of this. So growing up, the four siblings, because of that pause, are like have an incredible bond. And the bond is one of the most authentic. I love sibling stories and family stories. But that kind of neat, like nurturing with each other, where even as adults, they know when to kind of align themselves to protect their mom from certain truths and certain decisions that they're making. And even though they might all go in different directions, that, that dynamic is so spot on in this book. So it's telling this whole like quarter of a century story of this family through um, Fiona's point of view. And it's a beautifully written tribute um, for the love of these siblings. And their their strategies, their hardships, but it's very meditative and it's not you know it's cheesy, it's not too sweet. And um, there's a quote that I'll finish with that Fiona says, because she's speaking about her family and, and poetry. She says, the greatest works of poetry, what makes each of us a poet, are the stories we tell about ourselves. We create them out of family and blood and friends and love and hate and what we've read and watched and witnessed. Longing and regret, illness, broken bones, broken hearts, achievements, money won and lost, palm readings and visions. We tell these stories until we believe them. So that kind of like sums up the way that all of these like insignificant events kind of pull together. So by the end, when it's by the end, when you're in 2079, you feel like you've gone through this whole journey with them. It's really beautiful and it's great to listen to too. So that's the last romantics. So my next book is The Lost Man by Jane Harper. And it is a book that is set in Queensland, Australia, in the outback. And um, it opens with two brothers who have found the body of their third brother who had wandered away from his car and um, died of dehydration out in the sun because apparently in the outback, if you were outside for six hours without water, you will die of dehydration. <laughs> and it, I mean, one of the best parts about this book, I feel like, is the setting because it's almost like another character it's just so harsh, the realities that they live with, like all of their cars are packed with water, food, in case they get a flat tire, they get stuck, they have like a backup thing in the car to make the air conditioning work. So the environment is very important to their way of life. So anyway, their brother was also found by a place called the Stockman's Grave which is kind of like a historical landmark out in the middle of the outback. And it's between the three brothers' parcels of land. And the brother who has died when he was in high school, he did a painting of the Stockman's grave that won an award and everyone talks about it. And it's sort of like this big thing in the family. But mostly, this book is about the oldest brother, Nathan. And he stumbles upon, like he's been sort of ostracized from the family from something that he did in the past. And throughout the book, you sort of learn about Nathan and his relationship with his teenage son, his relationship with his brothers and his mother and his sister-in-law. And they're all sort of intertwined. And um, I think that it's sort of sold as a mystery, but it's really just a novel. And it's just about this one man's life and how it unfolded in ways that he didn't expect. And also um, his, his desire to be better than what he thinks of himself in that moment and how he's always been trying to make up for something in the past. But it's definitely a great book about family and living in a really harsh environment and what it means. It's just super interesting. Like they live, they're brothers and they share this land and everybody's house is an hour and a half from each other. Like that, it's just so huge and vast. So you really get a feel for what it must be like to be there. So. I highly recommend it. I did her first book, The Dry, um, for my first book buzz. And um, so she is sort of turning into one of my favorite authors. So I hope you try it. When did this just come out? Is this her 
This this is her newest. So she wrote The Dry, and then she wrote one called Force of Nature. And the main character from The Dry is the main character in Force of Nature. So this is a standalone. That's kind of a yeah, series. Right. Yeah. So anyway, I highly recommend it. So my next book is called All the Bright Places. Uh, this is by Jennifer Niven. Niven? Um, it's a YA book, and it's about two teenagers named Finch and Violet. Um, and basically, they meet <clears throat> pretty unconventional way. Um, they're on the bell tower of their school, about to jump off, um, and they meet each other. And um, they each insist that they were not going to jump off. Um, and then uh, they kind of get to know each other, and so. Violet just recently lost her older sister um, in a car accident, and so she's struggling to cope with that loss, and Finch has this um, like fascination with death, and throughout the book you read different ways that, not that he has tried to kill himself, but he's thought about it and says, you know, oh, this is what would happen, this is what it would feel like, um, so that's a little weird. Um, but basically they, get to know each other, and Finch really likes Violet. Violet does not like Finch. She doesn't want anything to do with him. And then they magically get paired together for a school project, and she has no choice but to work together with him. And um, they're going around their town, and they have to find like these new places. And um, she, of course, starts to fall in love with him, and um, she gives in to him. And so it's just this really quick, it's a romance, fiction, comedy sometimes, um, of their journey together. And um, there's, you know, she lost her sister, so there's some very intense home life, there's some mental illness, um, and it's just really fast, and you know, it's over before you know it. Um, but it's a really good read, so I would highly recommend it. The next book that I'm going to talk about is The Dreamers by Karen Thomas Walker. So, to bring it back to Stephen King, um, <laughs> when I first heard about the premise of this book, um, I almost passed it up because last year Stephen Owen King released a book called Sleeping Beauties, which is about all of them in the world fall asleep and cannot wake up and basically find a destroy the world. Um, so, <laughs> and in this book, this opens up a girl named May who's a college freshman in a small California college town. And in her dorm, her roommate Kira does not wake up. Not dead, nothing visibly wrong, this does not wake up. And so May is kind of like a shy, loner type anyway, but then May is like in quarantine with the rest of the dorm. So that has like its own problems there, but then another person falls asleep, and then another person falls asleep, and it spreads, and it goes all throughout California. Um, so, I didn't think I was going to like it, but I did it anyway. I read this book because previously, um, Walker released a book called The Age of Miracles, which is another speculative fiction that was very good, and I love that. And I love this, um, and I'll tell you why. I feel like in The Dreamers, you really become attached to the characters. They are multifaceted, yet um, you relate to them, they speak to you, you're Good year. Uh, good day. I was like, hey, say something, say something. Like, you, know, you just like want them to do well. You want them to get better. Like, there's a family who lost, loses a mother, and then it's like a father taking care of these two little girls. And the whole time, with the with the father, I'm like, can you like wake up, like deal with this? Like you just, you, it's almost like a movie where like you're trying to like tell that person, don't go upstairs, don't go upstairs. It, it's like the whole book is like that. Um, but with open touch, it's very sensitive. It's tugs at your heartstrings, um, and the ending's not quite what you think it's gonna be, but it's not the, like, it's not Armageddon, the world's an end, but it's not what you expect. Um, it's not a fast read, it's a good book club book because there's so many things you can talk about this, you can talk about ethics, you can talk about dreams, you can talk about what would you do if, there's so much meat in there to um, learn more about your people in your group. Um, it's also one of those books that is good for a teenager, if they are up to it. Um, it's not super hard to read, but it has a little bit of literary grit to it as well. Um, Paige Turner, Suspenseful, Becky Love, I think you'll like it. Try it. 
So my next book is The Witches of New York by Amy McKay. Amy McKay wrote a book called The Birth House that a lot of people love, but I haven't read yet. Um, this book is like, it checks all my favorite things. <laughs> There's a list of my favorite things. It's 1800s, it's New York City, it's witches, it's ghosts, <laughs> it's um, magic and supernaturalism. It's like all of my favorite things. So at the center of the story is a tea shop in New York City called Tea and Sympathy. Um, it, this is the year, and there actually is a real shop called Tea and Sympathy now in New York, but I don't think it's related. Um, so it takes place in the year 1880. And um, the shop is known for its tinctures and its teas made from herbs and a little bit of magic. Um, and it's a gathering place for women. It's a safe space for women to go and to talk, um, to talk about things like um, how to avoid pregnancy or how to encourage love and that kind of thing. And um, the women who run the shop are, it's two women. Eleanor is, she's like the hedge witch, if you will. She's the one who has like a book of, of recipes and spells and she makes the tinctures and the teas. Um, and then Adelaide is the seer. She reads your tarot cards and could tell your fortune. Um, and so the two, these two women work together and run this shop. Um, and they post an ad uh, looking for a shop helper. And the ad is answered by this 17-year-old girl named Beatrice. And Beatrice is kind of alone in the world. She's come from upstate New York, um, where she was raised by her spinster aunt um, after her parents died when she was young. And she's always been fascinated by science and magic. She's always gathered as many books as she can and read about um, whatever, everything she can about supernaturalism. Um, so this isn't, it, this is historical fiction with like magical realism woven through. So this isn't like an alternate version of New York. It's very more historical fiction than anything else. Um, and so she answers their ad and they hire her and they sort of realize right away that the three of them are like meant to be together. She, they all have separate paths, separate abilities, if you will. So Eleanor makes the teas and the tinctures. Adelaide is the seer and um, Beatrice, it turns out, can communicate with the dead. She didn't really know that was what, what was happening until she meets these women, um, but then they help her realize that this is her gift. Um, and they sort of gently encourage her to, to use the gift. Um, but in the background, this tea shop and everything that's happening, it's 1880s New York, and there's a lot of hostility toward the shop and the women. They're single women sort of running a business together. Um, and there's a lot of religious zealots who are railing against anything supernatural. Um, and there's also a vice squad um, who will pros prosecute anyone who is encouraging birth control, for instance. Like, that was illegal. Um, and so they sort of have to keep everything under wraps, um, but they're constantly being targeted. And then Beatrice, on the night before she's supposed to demonstrate her abilities to a crowd, she disappears. Um, and Adelaide and Eleanor aren't sure if they pushed her too hard and she ran off or if she was taken by one of these crazy religious zealots um, or the vice squad because they would just, they would basically put you in a mental institution for being crazy if you um, were caught doing one of these things. Um, and so that's, that's the main hook. But this is one of those books that um, I just wanted to sink into it and never leave. <laughs> like it was such a wonderful world to be in. Um, and it's, she is such a wonderful writer. I can't believe I've never heard of her before. Um, but every character is so well described and so well drawn. You feel like you know, she tells you just enough about them so that you care about what happens to them and what they think about things. Um, and it also has this unexpected sort of lightness. Like there are some scary moments, but it's not heavy and dark at all. It's, um, it has a really nice ending. <laughs> um, and it reminds me of Alice Hoffman, who's one of my favorites, so I feel like Alice Hoffman. And also, it's very similar to the Diviner series by Little Bray. It's a very similar feeling, except the Diviner is terrifying, and this is just more like <laughs> scary. In moments, it's scary, but um, it's wonderful. <laughs> they should be called the Virtue Squad. The what? Because they're like, they're enforcing the virtue. virtue. <laughs> um, okay. That sounds great, though. So this is um, brand new. I think it just came out this week. It's called The Line Tender, and it's actually um, it's by Kate Allen. It's a debut novel, and it's actually for middle school 
but it's one of those has a really good crossword feel. Like I would tell a lot of adults to read it because it's it's kind of like you know the the fact that I don't know if anyone's read the one that saved my life, which was written for kids, but it has this like really great readability that everyone can connect to, and that's what I felt about this one. Um, so it's. I feel like I'm saying the same thing about the last romantics, but it, I guess it kind of connects where it's like a younger version of a similar kind of feel. It's a sorrowful, hopeful, and quiet, and ultimately tender story, and it takes place in Rockport, Massachusetts. And um, the main character is Lucy Everett, and her mom was a marine biologist studying sharks. And when she was, when Lucy was eight, her mom was off Cape Cod, um, and she died while she was studying this this whole research about great whites. And so now, um, in the beginning of the book, she's 12, and it's this really hot summer in Rockport. And her and her dad, have not, they've been getting on okay. Luckily, one of the best parts of this book is this close-knit community of Rockport. I wish I lived in Rockport, and I wish I visited it more, because it's just like the way that it's described here and the way that the community surrounds them, even though her dad is still basically depressed and not really moving on. They're both kind of in this, like, you know, on the state, there um, they do have a lot of support from from you know neighbors and everybody in town. Like everybody knows everybody. So um, Lucy gets on in large part to her best friend, this boy Fred. He lives across the street. He's got two sisters and they're this Irish family. And um, Fred is super cool. One of my favorite examples is that she's twelve and in this beginning of this book she gets her period and she walks across the street because Fred has sisters and a mother. And they're not home, Fred's home, and he just hears her out and very calmly goes to the cabinet and gives her my doll because she tells him what's going on. And I was like, that is a cool dude. Never mind an adult. Like, it was just a real example of how he's just cool and calm, and, and he's a really good friend to her. So um, they are studying this. They're making us, they're doing a school project this summer and making a field guide. So they're examining plants, and he loves science, and she does, and she draws all the pictures. And then this great white shark washes up on the shore. And so this is like a big kind of moment for her in terms of it reminds her of her mother and her mother's on her research never got finished. And then um, halfway through the summer, another tragedy strikes town. Um, I will not spoil it, but it's pretty horrific and it's sad and it kind of washes over this grief over Lucy again. So now she's processing both grief, um, both grief of her mom and this other thing that happens. And so she doesn't really know how to center herself, but she kind of dives back into her mother's research. And, um, and trying to get her dad and this other local widow and all of these people together because so, she wants to you know, research this great white shark and, and finish this project. So it's, it's quiet, like I said, it's contemplative. All the characters are wonderful. It takes place in 1996, which I also love because being, you know, it being local, there's a scene where the old friend's older sister takes them into Boston the day to Harvard Square where they visit Newbury Comics. And like all of these details of the music they're listening to, I'm like, oh my god, that is like so charming. I wonder if like like I remember that being such a big highlight to go to do. Um, so it's and it's local and there's tons of shark facts in it, and it's really a beautiful story. It's it's a story about friendship and loss, and it talks about anxiety and how it's sometimes it's okay to not always be okay. I think that's really important. And everybody in the book is kind. And I'm not saying they're perfect, and I'm not saying that people don't really make mistakes and do horrible things at times, but like every, all the characters are kind and always, so it kind of fills your heart in a good way. So um, that's The Lion Tender and it's by Kate Allen. It's beautiful. Okay, so my, my next book is called The Cheerleaders by Kara Thomas and it is a Wiley novel and it, and I feel like the title doesn't do it justice. No, that's, a great um, that's the first thing I want to say. <laughs> but it, it is a mystery, and um, it start. I'm just going to read this little synopsis that I found. Um, there are no more cheerleaders in the town of Sunnybrook. First, there was a car accident. Two girls dead after hitting a tree on a rainy night. Not long after, the murders happened. Those two girls were killed by the man next door. The police shot him, so no one will ever know his reasons. Monica's sister was the last cheerleader to die. So this novel is told from the perspective of Monica. It's five years after the cheerleaders have died, and um, Monica is starting her junior year of high school on the dance team, which is sort of 
like the replacement for the cheerleaders because they did away with the cheerleading team after the tragedies that happened. And Monica is um, very smart and clever and she finds out a lot of things that are suspicious. So the, it starts out where she's starting junior year of high school, she's had a fling with an older boy or man over the summer, she's recovering from having an abortion, and she's looking for pain pills in her stepfather's desk, and there she finds, evi not evidence, she finds her sister's cell phone and some letters, and it starts her questioning what she's been told about the murders, and um, everything that happened. So as Monica starts to investigate, she meets another girl who has somewhat of a mysterious past and together they start investigating the crimes. And um, I felt like it was really smartly written. It's a mystery that I think is definitely a YA and beyond. Like to me, it read like an adult novel. Um, and the reason why I read this is because we do something at the library called Read Next, and um, several, I gave the book to, the, another YA book to our patrons, um, One of Us is Lying. Okay. So I've been looking for books sort of like that because people like One of Us is Lying so much, and this was recommended, and I don't know if it's exactly like one of us is lying. It's not quite as teeny, like yeah, te you know, yeah. like it doesn't have as many teen themes, I guess, as one of us is lying. It's a little more mature. School, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah it doesn't like, have that high school feel. I mean, this has that. She's very angsty. Monica does some very teen things that you're like, oh, why are you doing that? <laughs> but um, I just feel like it's smart. It's a smart story, and um, definitely equal to an adult mystery. So, if you like my day, you might like it, or mysteries. <laughs> All right, so my next book is called The Butterfly Garden. It's by Dot Hutchinson. Um, I am ashamed to admit this, I bought this in a bookstore. Um, <laughs> um, so, I think I read this probably in 2016 and it's stuck with me ever since. It is so good, it's dark, it's twisty, it's thriller. Um, I recommended it to every single one of my friends and I insist that they give it back to me because I love it so much. Um, and it's really hard to kind of talk about the plot in depth without giving away a lot of it. Um, but basically it switches in between two timelines and so one timeline is um, from the point of view of the FBI and they have just rescued these group of women, girls, who were kept in, um, I, I get to that, but um, the, the main woman that they're looking, that all the girls are looking towards, who they think is like their leader, her name is Maya. And so this whole thing takes place in um, the FBI's in interrogation questioning of Maya because they're not sure if she's part of the whole operation that was holding these women um, because they are so attentive towards her and they do look towards her for like all of their signals and what they should be saying. Um, and so you learn that these women, they were all taken by a man um, and they never knew his name. They call him the gardener. Um, and so basically he abducts these women and um, he tattoos butterfly wings on their back and um, he keeps them in this like giant terrarium in his backyard and so there's a terrarium? Yeah, well not, not a terrarium, no, but horrible. I'm I was sorry. so good. You read it? I this read sounds it. like, is it no, it's, it's terrible. Okay, it's yeah. No. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> um, yeah, so it's told by the point of view of the FBI that's interviewing her and from her point of view like in present tense of her living through this um, and so it's just a really great novel. You learn about some of her backstory. She didn't come from a great spot. She didn't end up in a great spot. Um, but they got great tattoos. So. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. But um, it's really great. I mean, I again read this. I think in two days. I mean, it's just super fast. You just I remember staying up until like one in the morning to read this thing. 
Um, it's great. I would highly, highly, highly recommend it. I love thrillers. Um, so this is a great one. So 10 out of 10. Yeah, I would say the closest book to that is like Silence of the Lambs. It reminds me of Kiss the Girls, which I did not read. Yeah, I watched that movie when I was way too young and horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dark one. All right, so this is our final round. A is going to be the lightning round. A because almost an hour into it, and B, I've been here for 12 hours and I'm fading very quickly. Um, <laughs> so my last pick is Kate Atkinson's transcription. Um, so if you ever heard me talk about historical fiction, then you probably know that I love Kate Atkinson. In particular, I love her book, Life After Life, and its sequel, It Got Ruins, because it's so good. Um, people love it or hate it, but I loved it. And I think this is going to be more, more people will love this book as well. Um, so as like I said, historical fiction, London, 1940. Um, 18 year old Juliet is recruited by MI5 to monitor British fascists during the beginning of the war. Um, C is very reluctant in working and doing her bit for the war, but C does it and goes through some things, one might say, involving a lot of different kinds of people, but particularly at Domingo. And if you read the book, you'll know what I'm getting at. Um, but the war ends, C does her thing, and C begins working for the BBC on a children's radio show called The Children's Hour. So life is good. C has not really PTSD, but C has memory of the war that he's trying to move on from. But a decade later, while she's doing her thing at the BBC, um, she runs into someone from her past and gets dragged back into a different kind of war. And it's kind of how she um, resolves those issues and what happens from there. Um, one of the things I really love about Kate Atkinson is when she writes her historical fiction, it's well-researched. Because someone who writes historical fiction has like the daunting task of balancing a good fictional story with pretty accurate historical fact. Um, and she does it beautifully. Um, at the end of the book, there's a bibliography and a whole author's note about how she came to this topic and where is he researched. So the library and he's like, yes, you did your bibliography, thank you. Um, so I'm also into it because I am currently obsessed with anything about female spy from World War I and or two. So if you like the Alice Network, the Lost Girls of Paris, or the Maggie Hope series, then you're gonna like this one too. Um, there is a twist at the end that's gonna, uh, that may offend some readers who instinctively give credence to the protagonist, but don't ever trust the spy. So with that said, transcription. I also love Kate Atkins. <laughs> okay, so my last book is Goodbye Perfect by Sarah Barnard. Um, so this is about a 16-year-old girl named Eden. Um, she lives with an adopted family in London, present day. <laughs> and um, so she's, she's kind of a, a 16-year-old who's very wary of the authority figures and the adults in her life. And this is mostly because um, she was put into foster care and then eventually adopted by this family when she was an older kid. Um, her mom um, tried to take care of her, had a lot of problems, basically let her down again and again. And so she's been adopted. Um, but she has kind of what a lot of other adults in her life call like, an attitude problem. <laughs> so, um, but the one constant in her life is her friend Bonnie, her best friend Bonnie. Um, she's like a perfect student. She's a great best friend. Um, she's very steady and Eden really relies on her. And then one day, um, Bonnie sends her a text that says, I'm doing it, I'm running away with Jack. <laughs> and so Jack is uh, Bonnie's boyfriend. She hasn't, Eden hasn't met Jack yet. She's just heard Bonnie talking a little bit about Jack, um, but she hasn't met him. She doesn't know who he is. Um, and so not long after she gets this text, um, she's in the shower, and her mom, her adopted mom, bangs on the door and says, the police are here, they need to talk to you. And it turns out that Jack is their music teacher at school. <laughs> so she's run away with a teacher, and her boyfriend all this time is the music teacher at school. And so all of the adults are, you know, freaking out. They're pressuring her to tell them what she knows. And Eden is not going to tell them what she knows, because Eden does what she wants. And um, she, Bonnie is texting her. Bonnie has a new phone number and is texting her everything that's happening. This is where we're going. This is what we're doing. This is what's happening. I'm so happy. This is finally what I, I'm doing, what I want, that kind of thing. And um, Eden 
is in a tough position, obviously. She doesn't know who to trust because Bonnie seems happy and Bonnie had been feeling a lot of stress and pressure over their upcoming GCSEs, which is like the English version of SATs. Um, and so they're just a few days away, so she's run off just a few days away from this big test. Um, and so Ethan has to figure out if she's gonna tell, when she's gonna tell. Um, but one of the reasons I love this book is because um, it's so spot on. Like it's, as an adult reader, you're like, what are you doing? I tell the authorities. <laughs> but from, it's, I think it's very realistically done and really well done, uh, the point of view of a teen. It's, um, I feel like there's been a lot of discussion lately about why books sort of portray teens in a way that's unrealistic. Like it might be a great book, but does a teen really do that and talk like that? Um, but this book is perfectly spot on. Like Bonnie, everything Eden and Bonnie say and feel and think is just perfect. So I think it's a, I called it a shining example of YA in my five star review on Goodreads. <laughs> Bonnie's an idiot. I'm not sure that. Uh, exactly, the frontal, their frontal lobes are so. Yeah, okay, sorry, Lightning Round. I forgot. Okay. So I'm showing you two because you guys are very lucky. Remember I said the thing about cliffhangers? So both books are out. There's a third coming out in this um, mystery series by Maureen Johnson. So the first one is Truly Devious. The second one is A Vanishing Stare. And um, I'm telling you, you'll read this. You'll probably read them together because it's a fast read. Um, this takes place um, in Ellingham Academy. It's a famous private school in Vermont on this like mountain. And it was made for, it's like an unorthodox school. It's made for the brightest thinkers, inventors, artists. And it was founded by this man was called Albert Allenham. He was an early 20th century tycoon billionaire. And he decided that he's going to make this school, this private school where, you know, he, people would want to learn and just study whatever they want. Like, you know, he wanted, everything was full of riddles and twisty pathways. And he literally made this campus where there's like secret tunnels and trap doors and everything was kind of a game for him and he was known for that. So, um, but shortly after the schools opened its first year, his wife and daughter were kidnapped and held for ransom. His wife's body was eventually found, but the daughter, Alice, was never recovered. And soon thereafter, Albert himself died under mysterious circumstances. So the only real clue that the FBI had was this mocking riddle, which I will read to you, that's at the very beginning. This is 1936. Look, a riddle, time for fun. Should we use a rope or a gun? Knives are sharp and gleam so pretty. Poison slow, which is a pity. Fire is festive, drowning slow. Hanging is a ropey way to go. A broken head, a nasty fall, a, ca a, car ca a car colliding with a wall. Bombs make a very jolly noise, such ways to punish naughty boys. What shall we use? We can't decide, just like you cannot run or hide. Ha ha, truly devious. So that is like serial killer, you know, cut out font there for you. And that is the only clue that the FBI had. Um, and this has been like, you know, Many, many years later, there's been books. People have been trying to solve this cold case. It's famous. And um, Alice, there's been people who've come forward over the years that have claimed to be Alice for this like inheritance, and it's never worked out. So cut to present day at Ellingham Academy. It's actually still going. And um, Stevie Bell is set to start her first year there, and she is obsessed with true crime and unsolved cases. And she wrote her entry essay about this truly devious case that she wants to solve it. So while she's there, the kids who go there are getting, you know, one wants to be a filmmaker, one wants to do this, and while she's there, um, a little mishap involving a secret tunnel and some dry ice, a very, you know, famous student ends up dying. And they think that Truly Devious has kind of returned. So you have like this present day mystery going on, but the best mystery is this cold case. And um, it's fast, fast writing, and if you love mystery, history, amateur detectives, and boarding schools, which Christy loves, um, it's a very clever ride, and so it just finishes on the um, cliffhanger, and I was like, what? So getting to read them like one after another is awesome, and this is actually, I think I like the second one even better, which usually never happens, but this just like, you delve a little bit more into the 1930s case and get way more details, so I can't wait for book three. So those are both by Maureen Johnson, and it's great mystery. Okay, so my last book is The Current by Tim Johnston. He also wrote The Descent, which I haven't read, but I've heard other people really loved it. Um, so this book opens up with Audrey and Caroline, who are at a college in the South, 
and Audrey finds out that her father is terminally ill and she wants to drive home to visit. So she asks her friend Caroline to loan her the money so that she can have, um, you know, take a bus or a train or some sort of transportation. <laughs> and um, so Caroline's having a really bad day at school and she's like, I'll just drive you. So they get in the car and drive from some unknown place in the south to Minnesota. And they get to the Iowa-Minnesota border and they stop for gas. It's like four in the morning and they go to use the restroom or Audrey goes to use the restroom and she is attacked by two men. And she gets away and Caroline and her jump in the car and then they're like super excited that they get away, but then someone sideswipes them and they're like sort of on the edge of a ledge. And then someone bumps their car and they go over. And Caroline passes away in the accident, but Audrey breaks her arm and is under the ice, but she is saved. And when Audrey wakes up, she will, she wants to find out what happened to her, or her father really wants to find out what happened to her because he used to be the sheriff in the town, but he's sick. And um, anyway, she, she's gone into, you know, Caroline died in this river and in the past 10 years previous to this, Holly Burke, a 19 year old's body was found in the same river. So, these two things that parallel each other sort of like resonate throughout the town and everyone starts talking about the crime from the past and Holly Burke's dying and how no one was ever um, convicted of the crime. And a young man named Danny Young at the time was thought to be the perpetrator of that crime, but they never had enough evidence to convict him. And Audrey's father was the sheriff at the time. So, the book sort of really focuses on the past crime and Audrey's desire now to figure that out. But it's really, you know, a novel about how loss affects people years later and how it affects the whole town. Holly's dad, the sheriff who couldn't solve the crime, the Danny's mother and Danny himself and his brother and the community as a whole. And um, so I think it's a really great novel. It's sort of billed as a thriller, and I feel like it's, it's really just a good novel and it makes you feel like what it's like to be in a small town. Everyone knows everyone's business. And, um, you know, what it's like when a tragedy happens and how people move on from that. And Audrey is a great, um, a great character. She, you know, you really, she does things that are really brave and really not smart sometimes, but you're really rooting for her to find the answers she's looking for. That's it. All right, so my last book is called More Than Words. It's by Janelle Santopolo. Um, she wrote the book The Light We Lost, which was an amazing book. Um, and it was about a woman in a, uh, love triangle, and this is about another woman in another love triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically this woman, her name is Nina George, um, she has an amazing life, she's got a fiance who growing up was her best friend, um, she has a great job working on a political campaign for like this guy that they think is going to win everything, and um, her dad owns a bunch of hotels and is like a billionaire. Um, so she is being groomed to take over his hotel when he passes away. Um, but she really doesn't want to. All she wants to do is write speeches for this um, politician. And you find out pretty early on in the book that her dad has cancer, um, and it's bad, and um, he dies. And so she has to take over the business before she was ready to. Um, and so, you know, she's thrown into, you know, the, the comfort of her fiancé, but the newness of this new man in her life. Um, and so she's, you know, caught being a little too friendly with him, 
causes issues um, for both his political career and for her personal life. And she finds out some secrets about her father that reveal that he was really not the man that she thought that he was. Um, and she doesn't really know if she ever knew him. Um, and so this is new, I believe it came out in March, um, but it's a really great fictional novel about a woman who kind of has to, she's forced to transform into like a really independent woman um, where she had really not had to be before. Um, and it's just, it's really great, transformative. It's not light, but it's not dark, so it's good. I feel like my eyes were really dark. <laughs> Well, I think that's it. Um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Copies of the books are here. If a book you want is not there, then you can fill out a whole tip in the back and we'll get it for you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.